Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. So you know you are what you eat. I bet you've heard that saying hundreds of times before, but when it comes to the food we eat, animals and plants, we are what they eat too. So when the plants we eat aren't nourished with healthy mineral rich soil, or when the meat we eat is fed a diet loaded with lectin-filled grains, antibiotics, and hormones, it can have a huge effect on our health, including on our weight and our energy levels. Well, my guest today says it doesn't have to be this way. According to him, there's a better way to farm that's not only good for you, but it's also good for the animal and for the planet. So Dan Walter is the founder and head farmer at Pastured Steps in Midlothian, Texas. And he's done something few farmers have done before. He's, re he's raised one of the world's first lectin light chickens. And I've tried one and both my wife and I really love the taste. In fact, we've now had two of them, thank you, Dan. On today's episode, Dan and I are going to discuss what's wrong with conventional agriculture, why a bigger bird isn't necessarily better, and what exactly is in that cheap chicken at your local supermarket. Dan, it's so great to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Gundry. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this conversation. All right, let's start with a basic question, Dan. How the heck did you go from being a mechanical engineer to running a farm? My idea of engineering was planning, designing, building, testing, redesigning, building. And I went to school for that and did those things. And then off to my first job. And after three years, I found that I was sitting behind a desk just doing the designing part. And I really missed the other parts of that. So I started my own business doing energy efficiency and uh, built a net zero house while doing that, running that company. And that led me to sustainability. I stumbled upon permaculture, took a permaculture course. And then uh, that led me to regeneration, regenerative agriculture. So for those who, who don't know, what is regenerative agriculture? You raise the same chicken over and over again, or no? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, agriculture can either have a positive impact or a negative impact. And unfortunately, most of the agriculture here uh, has a negative impact. We're depleting the soil of nutrients. We've lowered our carbon in the soil. Um, infiltration rates are down. So regenerative agriculture has a positive effect on the soil. We're building so topsoil. We're increasing the water capacity. We're doing all these things that help the microbiology thrive in the soil. You know, I, you, you brought up a great point. Uh, soil is a great place to store carbon, right? It's a, it's a carbon sink, or it should be. That's right. Um, our soil used to be about 8% organic matter, and most of our soil in the country today has dropped to less than 1%. So all that carbon has gone into the air, and now we're trying to get it back into the ground. And so when you, so I, maybe we'll get into this, but where, uh, I think people need to understand that re regenerative agriculture, at least the way I think most, uh, most people practice it like you do, uses animal waste as a part of this regenerative agriculture. Is that putting words in your mouth? No, that's exactly right. There's a lot of different ways to do regenerative agriculture, uh, but animals is by far one of the more effective ways. And they cycle that carbon back into the ground. Um, as long as your animals are out in the pasture, not in a barn somewhere, they're putting that fertility back on the ground. So I, so this net zero house and everything, is, is that kind of what stoked your passion about regenerative agriculture? Well, the energy efficiency led me to sustainability. And then when you get out there on the ground, you found <laughs> there's not enough left to sustain. You have to go beyond that. So you have to start regenerating things to get it back to where it was at one point. 
So did you, I mean, did you ever have a farming background? I mean, were you in 4-H club growing up or <laughs> was this all, all brand new to you? Um, I always had animals. I raised ducks and chickens as a kid. So there's a little bit of experience with that. And then we had a home flock of chickens while I was running my other company. And um, just slowly started adding on these different pieces of animals and I decided to go full time with it. So where does, so, all right, so you've had chickens most of your life. Where does, where does animal welfare fit into your vision? And how do you do it differently on your farm? Well, I think the key is that the animals are expressing their natural behavior. That means cows are allowed to forage for their own food in, out there in the pastures. They're not locked up in a barn. Uh, pigs are not on a cement slab. They're out there in the dirt and mud. And then chickens, they're not cooped up in a building all day long. They're out there where they can forage, they can gather bugs, and they can take dust baths in the sun. Oh, in those environments, there's a lot less stress on them, and they're able to thrive. And, I mean, can you, uh, it's obvious uh, to most people, but a, uh, you know, a, a pig rolling around in mud, uh, to me, strikes me as a rather happy animal. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a pig on a cement slab is probably a very unhappy animal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what? Let's ask, let's go start one of these questions that everybody asks. Um, and I I grew up in Nebraska and had many uh, family friends who were farmers, and uh, I learned early on that chickens were an essential part of any farm, because at least in Nebraska the chickens were let out into the fields where the cows were and they would head for the cow pies and they would dig through the cow pies looking for bugs and they would spread the manure and they then came back you know to the coop and laid eggs and but they were an essential piece of this of this whole piece and i was taught from day one that chickens love bugs they're insectivores um is that is that your experience Absolutely. That's the first thing they do is run straight for the cow pats. And I tell people that and they're kind of disgusted by it. But <laughs> that's the way nature sanitizes the pasture and it cleans up those parasites out of the, the cow patties. Yeah, they are, it lowers. They are. Yeah, it, it drops your fly pressure quite a bit on the cattle. So uh, what, what you're saying is that uh, nature and farming, the way it was designed, is a, is a pretty slick system from an engineering standpoint. Yeah, nature does it best. And we work really hard to try to do it our, our way, which is not necessarily better. So what's the problem with the way most chickens are raised now? I mean, isn't bigger better and faster producing better? Without ripping on other farmers too much, <laughs> uh, we can go through a little illustration and uh, just imagine you and your closest thousand buddies all lived on the a building the size of a basketball court and they bring all your food in <clears throat> and they tell you we're not going to take anything out of this room until you guys have lived your lives um, just imagine what that environment would be like after a couple of days after a couple of weeks after a year and then they're going to feed you a diet that's high in carbohydrates what what types of things can you imagine that that environment would be like after a little while uh, you'd be fat and angry, I would think. <laughs> yep, there'd be high, high levels of stress. There would be a lot of sickness going around. As soon as one person got it, it would spread to everybody. Uh, you would be walking around in waste up to your knees, probably. Uh, just probably the most unhealthy environment you can imagine. And yet that actually is how most commercial uh, chicken raising is done. Yeah, probably 99.9% .9 of all the chicken that's available in this country is raised in a facility like that. And so, obviously, it has been brought to a science where you can get a chicken from a hatchling to ready to eat in now a matter of, of weeks, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. I know guys doing it in five to six weeks. Yeah. Those chickens grow so fast, they outgrow their frames. They have trouble walking. They usually have heart problems because their organs don't develop quick enough. 
to support their size. And we do that in the name of uh, efficiency and cost. Um, yeah, efficiency is the number one goal. Most farmers, um, they get paid so little, they have to turn them over as quick as possible. So what do you do at your farm better? Um, for I mean, for the environment and for the bird? Well, our chickens are raised in a completely different manner. We've got these portable shelters that are completely bottomless. So the chicken's feet are on the ground, and that's actually where the name Pastured Steps came from. Everybody puts steps or footprints on the ground. And then they roam around in this tractor all day long, then they scratch in the dirt, they eat the grass and the bugs, they leave their manure behind, and then we move that tractor every single day. And when they're older, we move them twice a day. So they're constantly getting a, a fresh salad bar, uh, new bugs, new grass, a new diaper to, to speak, and it just, they're moving away from their manure, so they're moving away from the disease and bacteria and any kind of pest pressure that might be there. So that allows us to raise them without any kind of antibiotics. Great. And we didn't get into this, but uh, my understanding is that even though it's illegal to give chickens antibiotics. In fact, most of them are dosed with antibiotics because there's a waiver. If the vet says, I think there's a sick chicken in there, you're not going to pull that guy out. You're just going to give antibiotics to everybody. I think antibiotics are used frequently. Um, hormones are probably what's illegal more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think there's a withdrawal period of a few days before you harvest them where they can't have antibiotics. I don't know what that is. But it's already in the meat, so oh well. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, now I've got a big question. Why in the world would you raise a lectin light chicken? <laughs> I was raising chickens, and I was feeding them the best organic feed that I could find. And I had a farm tour. And one of the customers there, which was on your diet, I did not know about at the time, started asking me what was in the feed. So I started listing off ingredients. And she was like, well, I can't have that. I can't have that. I can't have that. And I thought to myself, you're not going to find chicken anywhere in the world that you can eat. And come to find out that that was pretty much true. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so and so what, what was in your, the best you could get conventional feed? The feed contained things like corn, soy, wheat. Um, I looked around, I did find some that didn't have corn, soy, and wheat. But they just substitute those out with things like peanuts and peas and lectins and uh, lentils. Uh, so they're all high lectin substitutes. So what's exactly? So what in the heck is in your feed, and what went into uh, developing it? It started by finding the best feed we could that didn't have corn, soy, and wheat. Of course, it had those other things, so we had to exchange those out uh, for items like sorghum. Um, millet, flax, sesame. So we kind of went through your yes list and tried to find things that a chicken would eat <laughs> that would have enough protein. And, and getting the protein levels where they needed to be was a little more difficult. Uh, but we were able to come up with something, and we're still refining it to, to make it better. But it, will, will chicken, I got a question for you. Uh, will chicken eat seaweed? I'm sure they would, uh, especially if you blend it all up and mix it in with the rest of their feed. Okay. Uh, but kelp, kelp is one of the ingredients that's used occasionally. Yeah. You know, um, we, you know, we started this program talking about, you know, you are what you eat and you, you are what the thing you're eating ate. But one of the things that I think we've, we've missed in probably thinking about lectins is you know, corn and soybeans and wheat in particular are very high in omega-6 fats. And uh, the grasses and the bugs that the, the, the chickens would normally eat are actually full of omega-3 fats. And we have to have you know, a good ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. There's nothing evil, per se, about omega-6 fats. In fact, there are some that are essential. But I think one of the things we've neglected to realize is that a chicken raised your way on pasture has a totally different profile and ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 
than a chicken in even fed organic corn and soybeans and grains is going to have a much higher omega-6 uh, fat profile than they ever would have had normally. And the same goes for you know, grass-fed and grass-finished beef or even pork. And I think you know, we all talk about inflammation and how so much of our diet is inflammatory, but I worry that we should be spending more time on the inflammatory fat in these organic chickens and cows because of what they're being fed. I've seen a couple of studies that are indicating exactly what you're saying as far as omega-6 to omega-3 and that ratio. Uh, also, they'll have more vitamin D and vitamin A and vitamin E, a couple of those other essential vitamins. Yeah, there's even studies now that farm-raised salmon, uh, farm-raised salmon used to be fed ground-up fish and that got too expensive. So they're now being fed ground up corn and soybeans and wheat. And the salmon, <laughs> which is supposed to be the omega-3 powerhouse you know, of the fish world, now has a huge omega-6 profile. And you know, so I just cringe when people say, well, all I eat you know, is organic salmon. And I go, well, yeah, but now it's, it's organic omega-6 salmon. <laughs> You're not even getting the omega-3 you thought you were eating the salmon for. Yeah, there's a, a term that's coming out that's becoming popular, and that's beyond organic. So it's taking the organic standards and it's moving it one step further. Yeah. And so, uh, have you had, so now you've been feeding the, this new food to your chickens. Uh, and how long have you been doing that? Um, I've raised two batches so far, and I'm about to do my third batch. So about a year and a half as far as the lectin-free chickens. And how, so how long does it take to get a full-grown lectin-free chicken? Well, the way I do it, it takes nine to ten weeks. So I'm using a, a slower-growing bird, and they obviously don't grow as quick on this feed as they would on a corn soy feed. Um, and I'm using a bird that will have a little bit more texture and more flavor to it. And that slower growth adds more flavor to the meat. And uh, so do you notice any difference in them, their growth pattern, their behavior? The biggest difference I've noticed is they're not as eager to attack the feed when you fill it up. <laughs> uh, they'll spend more time foraging and they will grow slower, obviously, which is more healthy for the bird, actually. Yeah. Well, we notice my wife is actually not a... A chicken fan as we know them, you know, even the organic chickens, I think, have just, they're, they're, they're pretty doggone blah. <laughs> and it's certainly funny. not like what I grew up, you know, in Omaha eating. And my wife, when we had, she really, we don't have chicken very much because of that. And my wife, I talked her in, you know, to having your chicken. And she says, oh my gosh, you know, wh where'd you get this? What's, what's the deal? This is, actually, this, is, this is really good, you know, and I hate chicken. So that's actually very high praise um, from, from a chicken hater. <laughs> and yeah, so we've actually had, you know, a second one of your chickens. Um, so, and yeah, you're right. These taste like, you know, what I was growing up in Nebraska eating, which is actually how chickens were raised. Okay, I think we got into this. So it takes a lot longer to have a chicken raised this way. And obviously, it's, this is more expensive to have a smaller chicken um, than, than it, that costs more. Right. So is it worth it, everybody wants to know? Well, I think you'll find that most things that are more healthy and better for you cost more. And that is determined by uh, the feed that goes into it more than anything else. My feed is nearly eight to 10 times more expensive than if I were to go out and buy a conventional grain. Wow. So you're, I mean, you're, you're paying for quality ingredients, right? That's right. You started out the show by saying that you are what your food ate. And then I would add to that by saying that your food costs what your food's food cost. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And so if people are going to say, well, yeah, but that's only for, 
really rich people and I got to put food on the table for my family. Uh, why, why should we all do this? Why should we care? We mentioned regenerative agriculture. Um, do you see kind of agriculture Armageddon soon if we don't make some change fairly quickly? Well, there's a lot of farmers that have speculated that. that uh, I'm not a real big global warming alarmist, but you can see the trends that uh, we pump so much carbon into the atmosphere that the weather patterns are changing to some degree. And we've depleted a lot of nutrients out of our soil, so it's becoming more and more difficult to grow things. We can put NPK on our soil, and that'll grow things, but it's lacking of nutrients. So uh, I've bought the best-looking orange at the store and got home to find out that it was completely tasteless. Probably didn't have any nutrients at all in it. Well, you're, you're right. Um, the, 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 for instance, the vitamin C content in oranges has dropped 70% in the last 40 years. Um, I mean, it's just that you go across the board, the amount of magnesium in, in our vegetables, in our spinach, is, is just plummeted to almost unmeasurable levels now. And you're right, it still looks like an orange, it still looks like spinach, but it actually has no resemblance to, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Because you're right. I think it's kind of like the way your gut works. I've listened to a few of your podcasts, so I'm starting to learn more. But from a soil biology standpoint, that biology is what makes those macronutrients available to the plants. So if the biology is not there, you can grow a plant, you can produce a fruit, but it doesn't have any nutrients in it. No, you're absolutely right. Um, in my next book, The Energy Paradox, is, is actually all about the, the soil microbiome is essential for the plant getting nutrients through the roots. And it turns out our microbiome is essential for us uh, to absorb nutrients through our roots, which is our microvilli. We literally have roots. And our, well, the things we swallow and the, the microbiome is our soil. And Hmm. But yeah. the, two, the two are intrinsically linked. Uh, we're, we're, we're basically a plant with roots that got up and walked. Um, <laughs> and that's, we have a mobile soil within us, which uh, so, is an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, so we have roots on the insides. Yeah, that's exactly right. Our roots are inside there. All right, so that is uh, our, other, our other farmers taking notice or they go oh man dan dan the chicken man you know you uh, you just go do that and you can starve to death well i'm sure if this gains traction others will follow um, as of right now most farmers are busy just trying to meet the demand from the pandemic um, so our demand went up four times just from the pandemic so there's a lot of people looking for alternative feed sources uh, i mean Every small farmer I know is slammed right now. So I don't know if they're going to be looking for to add new products on or if they're just trying to meet the demand that they have. And we'll see how things change over the next year or two. Is there, is there pressure on the small farmer from big corporations? To, that they come in and say, oh, you know, come on, we'll, we'll buy you out for X amount and you just shift over to the way we want to do it? I think all the pressure is from the consumer that's looking for alternate food source. Um, the, the stores around here were out of meat for a while, and they were out of eggs, and everybody was calling me up asking where they can buy chicken and eggs, and we were sold out for a couple months there. Uh, are there other farmers around the country who, you know, are are trying new ways of feeding chicken? Certainly. You know, the idea of pastured chickens is not a, a new concept, but you're right. Most places that I've contacted, um, there's still a lot of pretty lousy things in, in the feed that they're giving their pastured chickens. There's kind of three levels of feed. You can start with conventional feed, which is going to be dosed with all kinds of sides, 
I called it a toxic suicide. So you have fungicide, herbicides, pesticides, all of that. And then the next level up is non-GMO. And this is where most small farms land is on the non-GMO side. And then the highest side is organic. And then the organic obviously has a lot fewer or, or, or none, maybe, as of chemicals in them. Um, but most of the small farms and most of the pasture-raised guys are using either non-GMO or organic. But even the, the, the non-GMO, I mean, what, 90% of the corn grown in the United States is GMO, even if it's not sprayed with Roundup? Right. Um, and most, <laughs> a lot of the non-GMO stuff is sprayed with various chemicals. Yeah. And we kind of forget that. We think non-GMO is going to be chemical-free, and that's not the case at all. Yeah, no, you're right. In fact, almost, almost all conventional corn and soybeans now are, are pre we treat it with Roundup as a desiccant so that harvesting is a lot easier. Um, That's right. Yeah. And people, unfortunately, don't know that. And, yeah, they, 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 they don't get the connection that non-GMO doesn't mean it hasn't been sprayed with, with Roundup or one of the other ones. That's right. So if you want to avoid chemicals, you need to go with an organic program. We're not certified organic, but we do everything as organically as possible. And then if you want these other nutrients and the things we've been talking about, you need to go with a pasture-raised version. And, um, and if you want to try to avoid the lectins, <laughs> you're now at the highest bar possible as far as raising the chicken. Now, I know when I uh, sent out an Instagram about you, I guess your next uh, crop uh, sold out rather rapidly, is, I guess. <laughs> It did, and I'm actually looking at adding another batch this fall to see if we can help out some of the people that weren't able to get a chicken or two on that sale. Well, let you know, let us know because we'll we'll certainly get the word out there. Uh, okay. Because, uh, like I say, it's uh, we need to support what you're doing for our community, but not only for our community, but we need to support you know the small farmer who's pasture raising their animals in regenerative agriculture because you know it, it always it's, it always takes from the bottom up to change the world and it, it takes little actions not some big downward action that changes mm -hmm. everything so you know i congratulate you and keep doing it and uh, sounds like your engineering degree is is paying off in ways you never thought possible that's right I get to do all those things. I get to plan, design, build, redesign, build again. <laughs> so all right. it's all those things I was missing, I'm, I'm now doing again. Well, great. You know, it's great having you on the podcast. And, you know, I, I loved hearing about you and I loved your chicken. And so does my wife. So how do people find out about your farm? And, uh, you know, will you announce your next batch soon? Well, the best thing to do is go to our website lectinlightchicken.com and then everything on there right now is sold out so you can scroll down to the bottom and subscribe to our email blast and then we'll send out emails as soon as things are available uh, and then we'll have another pre-order sale that goes on and people can order the chicken from our next batch if it sells out then we'll we'll do it again and you um being in texas you can raise chicken you can pasture chicken throughout the year well, I've taken off the month of August because it's just too hot. Uh, chickens start dying when it's over 100 degrees. Interesting. Um, you have to water them down just to keep them alive because it, it's just so hot. And then I usually avoid January and February just because freezing temperatures are difficult as well as far as keeping your water lines unfrozen, uh, yeah, yeah. those sorts of things. Uh, I'm going to push this next batch probably into January, so we'll see how it goes. All right. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for doing what you're doing, and maybe you can convince some some more farmers. So I yeah. So I think you ought you ought to look at it as a chicken wine club. Uh, you know, you join <laughs> join a wine club. We've got you know the next vintage coming, and you get the first pick. Um, yeah. So this is a chicken club. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, it's certainly a different chicken than you'll find anywhere else. Yeah, I completely agree with you. All right, thanks a lot, and we really appreciate you and what you're doing. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.
Okay, it's time for our audience question. Ole Wernerson on YouTube asks, Olive oil has a large amount of monounsaturated fat as well as saturated fat and has a bad omega-6 to 3 ratio. So how is olive oil a health oil? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting with the Minister of Olive Oil in Italy in the past. And one of the things that I've learned through the years that he backs up is that the monounsaturated fat in olive oil, which is oleic acid, is not the wonderful, marvelous, save your life oil that some people make it out to be. It's uh, merely a monounsaturated fat. It's the same monounsaturated fat, for instance, in avocados. Uh, most of macadamia nut oil is a monounsaturated fat. Uh, most of um, even other not so good oils for you have a high monounsaturated fat that I won't mention. Well, I will, canola oil. But what's important is not the omega-3 fats, which are almost non-existent, not the omega-6 fats, which are almost non-existent, but the polyphenol content of the olive oil. And it's the polyphenols that actually give the health benefit to olive oil. So the more you think of olive oil as a delivery device for polyphenols, the more you begin to appreciate its benefit. And the more you find olive oils that are bitter, more bitter, more better, and we actually judge olive oils by their cough factor. If when you first taste the olive oil, it gets you coughing, that actually is the polyphenol content. So you really want uh, an olive oil with a huge polyphenol content. And Nuvo olive oil, the first pressing of olive oil, in general has the highest of the polyphenol content. So don't be, don't be scared or uh, sucked in by, well, there's monounsaturated fats and saturated fats. It's the highest polyphenol oil there is. For instance, the polyphenol content in olive, oil, in olive oil is 10 times higher than in coconut oil. There actually are polyphenols in coconut oil, but olive oil just blows everything else away. So, that great question, though. Okay, time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from D. Marie Cal on iTunes, who gave us a five-star review and wrote, I learn something new every time I listen to Dr. Gundry. Thank you. Keep doing what you do. I've never felt better than I do now because of you. Well, thanks for the kind words and the review. You know, each time you rate and review us on iTunes, it helps us reach a larger audience so we can continue our mission of transforming everyone's health all across the globe. And I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week, and thanks for your kind comments. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.